the MBS review, is, is it a mechanism for the government to find huge savings? or will you find a few savings and reinvest them? What, what's the... uh, not at all. The primary purpose of the MBS review is to modernise the MBS. And what we know is it doesn't reflect contemporary practice. Yeah. It's even archaic and out of date in parts. And when I talk to specialists and doctors, they tell me regularly that yeah. the procedures that they undertake are not there. They have to find these workarounds and um, it's administratively complex. Yep. Having said that, the approach we will take is the same approach we've taken to the budget as a whole, which is that we'll harvest savings and reinvest carefully. So I see this as reinvesting in the MBS and delivering efficiencies to government. But the primary purpose is that modernisation of the schedule. Now the freeze is coming, the rebate freeze is coming very soon. There seems to be some discussion that if you find savings through this review that perhaps the rebate freeze will be unfrozen, is that...? I'm calling that a pause in indexation because I don't want it to be there a day longer than necessary. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have inherited from the previous Labor government a dire set of financial accounts and economic responsibility will always be our number one concern. Yep. But we know that it's not in the interests of either government or doctors to freeze the rebates and to have those payments essentially falling over time. And while I don't agree that they're falling as much as my uh, opposition colleagues say, uh, expert advice from my own department says that the freeze is, is, is resulting in reductions of closer to $2 than $8. Yeah. But leaving that aside, I appreciate the point doctors make to me, which is that um, they would prefer to see a systemic review of the system and governments realise where uh, realise the efficiencies where we can with the waste and duplication that they're only too willing to point out to me. Yeah. So I come back to my point, harvest the savings and reinvest for the benefit of both government and the medical profession. Now you've been, like your predecessor, actually quite eloquent about the need for people that can afford to pay to make a contribution. The rebate freeze, though, applies across the board. Indigenous patients, marginalised mental health patients, uh, and it affects practices operating in poor areas just as it affects practices in the richer areas of, say, Sydney and Melbourne. I mean, what, what justification can you have for a blanket freeze that affects patients no, ma no matter what? their ability to pay. What we are saying is that we are pausing the payments to the medical profession. We're not saying that those medical practitioners can't choose to charge appropriately, yep. utilising our bulk billing incentives, which of course are bigger in rural and regional areas, and we have substantial bulk billing rates in our poorer communities. So if I can use my own medical practice as yep. an example, my my doctor sees patients who can't afford to pay and bulk bills them. Sees patients who can afford to pay a little bit and charges them a small amount. Sees me and charges me probably the maximum. So um, <laughs> in that way, the costs that patients pay are socialised yep. in a, a sensible way across the practices population. And I think that works and I think that allows the continuing bulk billing of those who are vulnerable. But again, I come back to my point, we, we don't, you know, we don't want to say to doctors, you know, it's a good thing to freeze your rebates. Yeah. Um, you know, these are difficult decisions we're making in a difficult fiscal environment. And that pause will not be in place a day longer than necessary. Now, I understand during the consultations, the GP groups were encouraging you to allow um, them to GP to charge a fee on a bulk bill consult. Uh, I want to know um, what your view of that policy is and why you've not introduced it, given it would make it easier mm. to uh, give a price signal where, where, where appropriate. Certainly it's raised by doctors and indeed by patients in many of my travels. I'm going to Logan South after speaking to the AMA this morning. If there's any doctors left in Brisbane, yeah. um, they're going to meet with me and tell me what they think and I expect I'll hear that sort of feedback. Um, it does need to be part of a proposal that is brought to us by the medical profession. Yeah. And um, I'm certainly listening and I'm certainly listening to uh, alternative views. So You're not ruling it out. Well, it's something that I've been um, made aware of. My primary focus 
in the area of bulk billing is that bulk yeah. billing be available to vulnerable patients to the extent that we need it to be. Yeah. But all proposers are welcome and um, I look forward to that and others being worked up through yeah. the review of the NDS and in particular our primary care advisory group because those two things are the cornerstone of how we will look at improving the remuneration that we make as a government to yeah. medical practitioners and and also the quality, safety and good practice that we know Australian doctors do better than anyone else in yeah. the world. So, okay, so the, the, the doctor groups have got to come to you with a coherent argument and convince you that allowing a gap fee on top of a bulk bill consult is going to contribute to improved healthcare. It's what? one of the things that's been raised with me, okay. but I, uh, I must emphasise that the co-payment, which has been talked about in your introductory uh, comments, yep. or the introductory comments in this conference, is completely dead and buried. So there will be no more imposed co-payment by this government. Yep. We've moved to two important new policy areas in that space, the review of the MBS yep. and the primary care advisory group, and they will inform us of uh, what is in the interests of the profession and yep. most importantly in the interests of patients. Because let's not forget that I am most interested in how we manage the chronic and complex burden of disease that more Australians will face into the future. Sorry to keep going on at this, but I just wondered whether perhaps you didn't want to go down this route of the gap fee on the Bill Bill Consult because you'd get the argument that it's a co-pay by stealth, that politically for you it was exposing you perhaps to too much criticism. I'm not uh, interested in political arguments at this stage. Yeah. I'm interested in good, sound policy ideas. And because I'm so pleased with the approach we've taken through our MBS review and the primary care advisory group, and so pleased with the response from health professionals and patients generally, yeah. um, you know, I know that there will be many good ideas that bubble to the surface through that, and that it won't be uh, me as health minister or the Department of Health dictating from our position what needs to happen okay. in medical practices. One last question. Um, do you feel that fee-for-service in the context of chronic disease is dead? Uh, no, I don't. Um, our fee-for-service model in Australia is a strong one, well supported by government, very well supported by government, and you only have to look at the cost of Medicare yep. to demonstrate that. But we also recognise that a form of blended payment, a form of enrolment for chronic disease patients, these are good ideas. The College of GPs has yeah. put these ideas forward to me and we all uh, know their concept of a medical home. Yep. Uh, instinctively, I like that. It makes sense and it really does provide a rational, in a government funding sense, but importantly in a health sense for the yep. patient um, uh, region of policy and practice that will look after our chronic disease patients better and yeah. keep them out of hospital for longer and that's got to be the focus.